Ooh, you're out of time. <laughs> the buzzer went off. <laughs> Usually you got a couple minutes to play with, but... All right, we're going to go ahead and get started tonight. It's good to see everybody here tonight. We have uh, several prayer requests that we want to look at and the information I want to share with you if you don't already know. Um, first, we, we do want to be in much prayer for um, Margie Hoskins' family in the passing of her mother, uh, Ellen Lee Master. And uh, if you don't already know, the arrangements are um, Friday from 6 to 8 is family night at, um, at the Butler Funeral Home in Roseboro. And then here on Saturday at 4 o'clock. And so, uh, but we do want to be in much prayer for that family and just pray for them as, as um, they prepare for that. Also, we want to continue to pray for the family of um, Johnny Smith and the family of Craig Jones. And so uh, we continue to keep those two families in our prayers. And you can see our new prayer request as well. Um, a co-worker of Dale Ackerman and a friend of Dean Bullard, um, motorcycle accident, um, Wendy Sessoms for bronchitis. Um, how about Betsy? Is she, how's she doing, Donald? Okay, all right, continue to pray for her. And um, you see several other requests here. And I'd like to open the floor tonight. You have a prayer request or a praise that you'd like to mention. All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Donald, will you lead us, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we have to be in your house this evening to tell your word and uh, have our business meeting. Our prayer is that as we come this way and have this opportunity in a little week or two to pause and uh, to be in, in worship, we just lift up to you those who are sick, those who are suffering, everyone that's on our list, uh, we're aware of, and we know there are many others who are sick and suffering in different ways, and we lift each one up to you and ask that you would bless them, that you would continue to heal and strengthen and encourage and comfort. We pray for those caregivers who faithfully stand by them each and every day and that you'll strengthen them and encourage them in their ministry. Uh, we lift up these families that have lost loved ones. We especially lift up Margie and Nori and their family and ask that you would comfort them through your Holy Spirit while uh, we do have the, the joy of knowing uh, that our loved ones are present with you in those moments of passing. We know that it's still uh, sorrowful to us that they're no longer with us. And we would pray that you would comfort them, that you would bless those who are part of the service uh, for our on Saturday and for the visitation on Friday. We, we thank you for uh, Pastor Josh and Jessica that you have sent this way to minister with us here in this community. We pray that you continue to reveal to us ways that we can engage the community in uh, about the ministries of this church that we can make a spiritual difference in their lives. 
Our prayer is that you would continue to bless our Sunday school, our Sunday worship. We thank you for those who have been added to our numbers here. And uh, we just ask that you will keep us mindful to encourage them and to uh, be available to them as they begin this new walk. And uh, it's so easy to, to get distracted and uh, we're very much aware that if we make a profession of any kind of commitment to you, that Satan is quick to approach us and to try to distract us and lead us in other directions. And our prayer is that you would uh, help us to, to minister to those young Christians here in our church. Our prayer is that for the rest of this community, that, Lord, as we go about our daily lives and as we share with them the love that you have demonstrated through sending your son, that uh, they become curious to know about this Savior and that they may come and, and accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and worship and work with us in this community here. We ask now that you'll lead us through this time of study Let's continue to bless Josh with the message that you would have this church to hear that would equip us and challenge us to be about your work here. Of course, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You'll take your Bibles tonight and turn with me to Romans chapter 9. We're going to look at verse 33 through Romans chapter 10 and verse 14. We have finished Revelation 12, and as you know, in a couple of weeks, we're going to start uh, the Experiencing God Bible study. And I just want to uh, announce that on the back table, there are more books. So if you have not yet gotten a copy of a book for Experiencing God, then you can get one on the way out. There's, there's a box there with, um, with plenty of books um, for you to get one. And I just want to remind everybody and just reiterate um, you don't have to do it this way. You're welcome to come um, and just listen and, and to just be, be a part of the study in that way. But, but I just want you to be as prepared as you can that, that at the back of the book, there is a code that you will find. And if you'll go and fill out and apply for um, a Lifeway uh, membership, which is free, you just set up an account basically, um, and then you just put the code in, and that just gives you access to all the videos for all the lessons that we're going to do. So on your own, you can watch the video, and you can hear the lecture um, from the author of the book, and, um, and then you can come that Wednesday night, and we can all uh, discuss um, each session. And so um, just wanted to remind everybody that that's uh, that's going to be the most beneficial thing we could do, is to, is to already have watched those videos and to have already filled out um, the questions and be able to have a uh, meaningful discussion. What I want to do tonight is to give kind of a primer for experiencing God. Um, and uh, did this in my men's group Tuesday night, and it really just spoke to me um, when we look at the content of the closing verses of Romans 9 and the first 14 verses of Romans chapter 10. A very, very powerful and applicable um, passage of Scripture. And so I think we need to begin first with the doctrine of sin. And so um, if you can imagine this, if you can imagine our first parents, Adam and Eve, they are walking and talking with God in the garden. They have what's, what's known as this uninterrupted fellowship. They didn't have the problem that we have in our worship, that we are sinful and our sin causes a problem um, in every area of our life and, and that also shows up in our worship. And so they're walking and talking with God and they're communing with God and they're having this this wonderful relationship with God. And you know the story in Genesis 3, how the enemy comes and the enemy deceives. The enemy is more cunning uh, than any other beast. And he, and he comes and deceives them and boom, sin is born. And what we find within the Old Testament and within Israel is they begin to commit themselves to this external kind of relationship with God. 
God always desired and wanted this relationship that's, that's based on faith. That's based on um, hearts towards Him. As a matter of fact, the prophet Isaiah says that uh, your lips profess me, but your heart is far away from me. And Israel continued to have this on-again, off-again relationship, and they somehow got it in their thinking that we can just come up with a couple of traditions, we can have some ceremonies, we can have a little bit of religion, and we can be really devout and really zealous to our rules and our regulations and our traditions and our ceremonies, while at the same time, they had a disconnect with God. And in this disconnect with God, God continues to try to bring them back. Bring them back to the main issue, which we find in the, in the very beginning. That you're not justified by keeping portions of the law. You're not justified because you were faithful to go home and read the Bible. You're not justified because you came to church on Sunday. You're justified by faith and not by works. Now we have a good balance of that when we read James and we understand that that true faith is fleshed out and proven by works. It's not that we're saved by works, it's, it's that true faith is going to produce something. And so while some scholars have tried to argue that Paul and James are at odds and they're working against each other, it's actually to the contrary. They're both right. They're both speaking to different audiences. And, and, and true faith that justifies us is proven and is produced in the works that you see. Try to put faith into practice. Try to really follow God and not have any works that point to the, your faithfulness towards God. You absolutely can't do it. And that's why James says, a faith that wouldn't produce anything, that's a dead faith. That faith can't save anybody. That faith has no substance. That faith really has no meaning and no place. And so Israel is... He's trying to get back, but they're trying to get back on their own merit and on their own system. And all through the book of Romans, Paul is just hitting them very directly and showing them, listen, uh, just because Gentiles have been given the gospel and Gentiles have come to faith in Christ and Gentiles have been saved and the adoption and the grafting in, that doesn't mean that God has canceled his promises to Israel. It doesn't mean that God has given up on them and God has forsaken them and God has moved on from them. I think we would understand and we would see from the history there is a temporal blindness there. But Paul argues in this very letter how God is very zealous toward his own people. We see that that same zealous heart appear within Paul. I mean, I want you to think about this for a moment tonight. We have it recorded in Romans where the Apostle Paul has such a heart for Israel, such a heart for his kinsmen, such a heart for the Jews, that he says to them, if it were possible, I would wish that I could forfeit my own salvation." That I could be cursed if that meant all of my fellow Jews, all of Israel, would go to heaven. That's a big prayer. That's a zealous thought. I don't know of anybody that's, that's willing to go to hell so somebody else can go to heaven. I guess the, the first question I would, I would pose at you would be, how zealous are we in wanting to see lost people saved? How zealous are we in praying that God would bring people 
to Christ? How zealous are we that we wouldn't just pray that and we wouldn't just say that, we wouldn't just proclaim that, but we would actually do something about it? You see, because real zeal is faith with action. It's not dead faith. It's not a supposed faith. It's not just saying, gee, I really wish that all these people that are in Beaverdam, that are unchurched, and that, um, that don't know Christ, I really just wish they would get saved. But, but it's putting action to that. How do we reach our community? How are we going to reach our community? How are we going to get in those homes? How are we going to reach those with the gospel? There are many people that aren't coming to Beaver Dam. They're not going to Evergreen. They're not going to Peter's Creek. They're not going to any church. They're just there. Matter of fact, I knew of a church that was um, so concerned about this. And this was when every church met at 11 o'clock. There wasn't some churches meeting at 10 and some churches meeting at 8.30 and some meeting at 9. So they decided that for this one Sunday, we're not going to worship at 11 o'clock like we traditionally would worship at 11 o'clock. Instead, we're going to worship um, after lunch. And what we're going to do at 11 o'clock is we're going to go on visitation. We're going to go around to the entire community and we're going to see who is at home at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. And we're going to visit them at that time and we're going to share the gospel at that time. The point of that was... You know as well as I do, many people say, well, I belong to this church, and I belong to that church. I'm a part of that church. I'm a part of this church. They want to see who's in their PJs, or who's reading the newspaper, or who's eating breakfast at 11 o'clock with no desire at all to, um, to go to church. The point is, how zealous are we to see people come to Christ that we put action with the faith that we claim to have? And so... If you'll join me in Romans chapter 9 tonight, we're going to look beginning in verse 33. We're going to read to verse 14 in chapter 10. And we're going to first see a gospel that doesn't make any sense. (laughs) At least not on the surface and not to the Jews. And then we're going to see the gospel that, that Paul is arguing for. And so let's begin by looking at verse 33, or I'm sorry, verse 30. What should we say then? Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained righteousness. Already it seems unfair, doesn't it? They didn't pursue righteousness, but they've obtained righteousness. Namely, the righteousness that comes from what? Faith. Not from works. Not from keeping the law, not from um, keeping ancestry or traditions, but from faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not achieved the righteousness of the law. Why is that? Because they did not pursue it by faith. But as if it were by works, they stumbled over the stumbling stone as it is written. Look, I am putting a stone in Zion to stumble over and a rock to trip over. And the one who believes on him will will not be put to shame. Now let's just stop there for a moment. We'll continue to read in a minute, but let's just stop there for a second. And uh, let's, uh, let's think about this. I mean, to the Jew that's reading, to the Jew that's hearing, to Israel, this absolutely makes no sense. I mean, the Gentiles that, that didn't seek righteousness, they obtained it. The ones that uh, didn't seek it are the ones that actually ended up receiving it. And, and the Jews, Israel, the ones that followed the law, the ones that had the tradition, the ones that had the Abrahamic heritage and the Moses ancestry, 
the ones that uh, that truly were zealous, they didn't receive it. One is operating by faith, and the other is operating by works. And if we go all the way back to two heroes, Abraham and Moses, Abraham is justified by works, right? No. Justified by faith. How is he justified by faith? What did he do? He believed God, right? Yeah. Yeah. God told him how, how numerous his descendants would be. He told him to go and count the stars and count the grains of sand. Abraham says, too many, I can't count them. As numerous as your descendants are going to be. And God accredited that to him as righteousness. That he believed God. And so he's justified by faith. Yet the Israelites that, that would claim that heritage and would claim to follow him would instead just keep some, some incremental parts of the law, not even the whole law, just the parts of the law that they wanted to keep. Now I had a lawyer tell me one time at a church that when you're dealing with the church constitution, and you've got a really big issue that the church constitution speaks to. And you're not following the church constitution in every other arena. Then what you're trying to claim the church constitution in for protection doesn't hold up. Will not hold up because you do not follow that constitution under most circumstances. Here you, you had the Jews that in most circumstances they weren't following the law. I mean, they had some parts of the law. They had pieces of the law. They even added to the law. And they were following things that, that, that technically weren't even the law. They were just things they added on to the law. And, and really, it was hard to differentiate, to, to, to separate what was actually the law and what was actually the add-on to the law. And so, when we look at this, at what must have been chaotic for the Jews... Let me ask this question for discussion. What is the gospel based on, and how does this make sense when we read verse, verse 30 through verse 33? Like, what is the gospel? If you were to put that into some simple words to, to explain to a person that had no idea what you're talking about, what is the gospel? Okay, all right, okay. Anybody else? What would you say the gospel is? It's Jesus dying on the cross, okay, all right. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. I like the connection there. It's just as simple as going back to the original, right? Okay, all right. Anybody else? What do you think the gospel is? You're, you're trying to explain that. You're, you're wanting to share Christ with somebody. You want to you give them this gospel. What is it? Mm -hmm. Now, with that in mind, and when we look at verse 30 through verse 33 in chapter 9 here, when you look at, at what Paul is, is driving at and what he's saying, um, how does that make sense in light of what you've just answered about the gospel? How does that make sense? How is that really fleshed out? Yeah. 
Paul is setting up an argument here, right, that, that, that from Israel's perspective, this wouldn't be fair, right? That, that the righteousness that the Gentiles did, did not seek, and, and through the works, right, they, they obtained. And, and they're over here seeking it with all their heart, working, you know, you know to the sweat of the brow, and, and they don't receive it. And so, um, in the interest of, of consistency, in the interest of fairness, in the interest of, of, of all they would know through their system, how is the gospel really, really fleshed out here when you look at these verses? I mean, like, how do you make sense of all that? What do you think? Boom. One word. Faith. And that word you're going to see, either faith or believe, I mean, you're going to see it all through chapter 10. It starts here, and then you're going to see it in chapter 10, and, and, and especially in verse 9, 10, 9. We, we know the Romans road, we have the Romans road down, we, we take children to the Romans road, we take people to the Romans road, right? That if you confess with your mouth, you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. And then in verse 13, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so over and over and over again, we're going to see just that believe and that faith. Faith, believe. If you believe in the gospel, the good news, that, that God sent his son Jesus, crushed his son for our sin and then raised him from the dead, sealing our salvation. And, and I love how strong verse 9 is, don't you? I mean, a lot of things in our life depend on a lot of things, don't they? I mean, but, but here, there's no dependence. It's an assurance. It's a promise. It's not that, that we place our faith in Christ, believing that God raised him from the dead and, and saying with our lips, I want Jesus in my life. I give my whole life to Jesus in the hopes that God would then give us salvation. In the hopes that we catch God on a good day. In the hopes that, that if God's in a good enough mood, he'll, he'll just look past my sin and forgive me and I'll be saved. No, this is a promise. This is an assurance. And, and when you connect it to Abraham, think about this for a moment. Why, why is it so important that we would know about uh, God's promise to Abraham? Why is it so important that we would study the righteousness of God um, by faith, and not by works? If God would keep an age-old promise to Abraham, we have assurance in the promise He's made us in Jesus Christ, right? If God won't go back on His promise through Abraham, it gives us assurance that He won't go back on, on His promise to us through Christ. But the whole thing is driven by faith. The whole thing is about faith. Okay.
Right. Yeah, and, and there's... <laughs> you have a comment, Donald? <laughs> And I, th I think one takeaway, too, from this is um, anything, uh, well-meaning, anything even faith-based, can, if we're not careful, also be polluted. And... Uh -huh. Right. Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And, and it, you know, and and not to completely get off on this, but but if you if you go back to kind of how that evolved to like within the baptism argument. You can go back to Acts and you can see a mis in, in my view, a misunderstanding of the whole household being saved because the father was saved. And you can really go into, I think, something that's more of taking a liberty, you know, on a text and, and, and kind of getting out of balance there. Even though we see a good principle that a lot of times when the father gets saved, he then would lead his household to Christ. But that doesn't mean we baptize infants and make that a mandate, right? So, yeah. No, that's, that's okay. I like discussion. Um, in look, let's look at verse 1 in chapter 10 here. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God concerning them, notice that them, is for their salvation. Now, let's stop there and let's ask this question. According to verse 1, what do we see in Paul that should be the priority in the church? And we can look right here at Beaver Dam Baptist Church. What priority do we see with Paul in verse 1 that ought to be the priority of this church? Okay, all right. Okay, all right. Any other thoughts? The lost, okay. All right. Anybody else want to want to kind of dissect it a little bit further? Do you see I mean, obviously we would see that, but I mean, do you see something else in relation to that that might stand out to you? Everybody be What's that? That's right. That's right. It's not that you're wrong in saying that. You're right. But, but, but look at what Paul's really saying here. Brothers and sisters, my, my heart's desire and prayer to God concerning them 
is for their salvation. It's, it's having that, that bleeding heart for lost people. And if we're looking at a, a zealousness, a zeal, a, a faith with action, we're looking at how Paul, Paul's prayer for them is this. This tells me that, that Paul had such a desire about it that, that he spent countless time praying for this. Now, how much time do we spend praying for lost people? I mean, we, we have prayer meeting and we share uh, stuff that's on our prayer list. We share um, issues people are having. We share... Um, difficulties people are having how much time are we putting in as a church praying for the lostness of this community the lostness of this area yeah okay mm -hmm. right You know, if we see the context here, like, who is the them he's talking about? Right, Israel, right? And, and so his heart's desire and his prayer is that they would come to Christ, right? That they would be saved. I'm not saying that didn't flow from the thanksgiving, but, but definitely his heart, the same heart that said, if it were possible, you know, I'd be a curse. I'm willing to be a curse. I'm willing to go to hell that, that they would go to heaven if, if that were a possible thing. We can really see a zeal that Paul had that the Jews would understand the gospel and the Jews would be saved. Think about the thanksgiving, Gary. And, uh, the thanksgiving you've received. The thanksgiving that we've received in Christ. The blessings we've received in Christ. That we want people to be saved, but we also do want people to experience the blessings of God that, that we've experienced. Uh, even, even going beyond that they would their souls would be saved. In addition to that, we want them to receive the blessings that we've received. So I can, I can totally see that. Um, look, at, uh, look at verse 2 and verse 3 here. I can testify about them that they have zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, since they are ignorant of the righteousness of God and attempted to establish their own righteousness, they have not submitted to God's righteousness. So we've established the them in the passage is Israel. Um, but when Paul says they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge, there's an ignorance there. What do you think Paul's getting at? Like, what do you think he's saying? Like, like, like what does that mean? That they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. Okay, yeah, okay. Any other thoughts? Yeah, and, and as we've already kind of addressed in this study, you know, when you look at Israel, it, it, was, it was always this one-track mind, 
right back to keeping these minute elements of the law. You know, you know, the zeal was not for God in the sense that they had this, had this deep faith in God. It was a zeal for the law, the parts of the law they were keeping. It was a zeal for their heritage. It was a zeal for their traditions. It was a zeal for those things. And, and we can look at, at them with judgment in our hearts, but is the American church not in jeopardy of the exact same thing? We can have a zeal for the church. We can have a zeal for whatever traditions we have in the church. We can have a, a zeal for the, the things we enjoy in the church, and we can be divorced from having a zeal for God. I'll never forget a couple months ago, I was... I was talking to a person um, about Christ, witnessing to this person on a visit, and they just kept going back to the church. They just kept going back to the church. Well, I, you know, well, I just want to, you know, come to the church, and I just want to come and attend the church, and I just want to come and be a part of a class, or I just want to come and be a part of this, you know, this attendance in the church. And, and they, the more we talk, just getting further away from the whole concept of the whole idea about Christ, about Jesus about really coming to a heart relationship with Christ. It was just all about the church. And there's a zeal there. It's not a zeal for God. It's a, it's a zeal for just something familiar. They had a familiarity with the ancestor and with the traditions and with the law and with all this other stuff, but, but it wasn't really for God. It wasn't really for God. You continue to see how Paul fleshes this out. Look at, um, look at verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Since Moses writes about the righteousness that is from the law, the one who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith speaks like this. Do not say in your heart, who will go up to heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or, who will go into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. On the contrary, what does it say? The message is near you in your mouth and in your heart. Now, this is something that, that scholars have debated and scholars have gone to the table on. Different answers are available depending on who you read. But just a, a very simple reading tonight. What do you think Paul is, is, is driving at with the, with the two questions he poses? With, you know, don't say um, this and don't say that. Like, what do you think he's really getting at? To, to bring Christ up, to bring Christ down. Yeah, Gary? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. You know, with these with these two statements that that Paul is making here, he is he is getting at the simple fact that that the Jews in whom he's writing to, they they didn't have the proper faith understanding of the resurrection, and they didn't have the proper faith understanding of the incarnation. And and so what he's really getting at here is you have to understand that, that this law that you're holding on to, that, that Christ is the end of the law, meaning the law is only properly interpreted through Christ. Christ didn't come to do away with the law. He came to what? Fulfill the law. He came to fulfill the law, that the law would be filled through him. And so, again, we, we look at this thing with faith. And so, I know we're running out of time, so let me, let me try to ask just one more question here. Um, in verse 9, we see Paul's driving idea here. What is, what is Paul really trying to communicate as we look at verse 9? If you, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And we always miss verse 10. 
But I was, I was at prayer one morning, and I had a gentleman that, that, that pointed verse 10 out to me. And, uh, you know, and I thought, wow, that's really good because that just explains verse 9. We usually stop with verse 9 and we say, here's, here's really what it means. But watch how verse 10 really acts as a commentary to verse 9. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness. It's not just a prayer they say. It's, it's fleshed out by resulting in righteousness from the heart. And one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. Not a meaningless prayer, but, but it really produces something. And so, in everything that Paul is arguing for, Christ being the end of the law, all that he's been saying here about faith, how does chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, how does that really give us the clear understanding of what Paul is trying to say here in the argument? What do you think? Okay. Very, very clear. Yeah, yeah. I like that, Iris. Good. Yeah. Any other thoughts on the table? We got to tell people. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right, right. And if we had time tonight, you would go in the remaining verses, right? And you would see how can they go tell unless they've been called, you know? How can they be saved unless they hear, right? And, and he, he goes into great detail on that. Um, any other thoughts? And just to close tonight, you know, as, as Paul is laying this argue out very clear, salvation is by faith. Glad you know the law. Be proud of your ancestry. Be proud of your heritage. But here's the deal. Christ is the, is the interpretation. He is the end. I mean, He is how we understand the law from the heart of God and and. You must believe this in your heart, confess this with your mouth, and people need to hear this. And people are not going to hear this unless people are raised up, saved and raised up to go and tell this. Let's, uh, let's close the night for a word of prayer, or with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this time of Bible study. We thank you, Lord, for just wetting our taste buds, Lord, on subjects like faith, prayer, evangelism, the need to go and to share our faith with others that don't know you, that are lost. God, give us a zeal. Give us a bleeding heart. Give us a passion for lost people in the community that you've planted us right here. And God, help us, Lord, to reach people that need Jesus. Which in the name of Jesus we pray tonight. Amen. All right, we're going to go ahead and move into our time of business now. I'll hand this over.